Hello and welcome. This is Lita Downs from the Center for Faculty Excellence, and I would like to welcome you to today's offering, A Worldwide Walden, Working in a Global Environment. Our presenters, Dr. Viral Anderson, along with Dr. Chow from China, originally presented this offering at the Walden Winter 2019 National Faculty Meeting in Tampa, Florida. Today, we have Dr. Anderson on the line with us. Dr. Chow was unable to make it, but Dr. Anderson will present the information. Welcome, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, thank you. Well, welcome everybody. We're really glad you could look at this. You know, when we look at Walden, Walden's just uh, increasingly growing, and I wanted to talk about Walden going into the global world uh, more than we are right now just in the United States because for us to be effective teachers, the more we understand about the cultures of the people that we're dealing with, the better we can work with them. And so some of the things we're going to be looking at for this session is we want to understand the importance of the cultural environments within our classroom. We, we have all this diversity coming from all over the world and and it can enrich our classes and but first we need to understand how they are different and most important we want to understand why they are different and and finally we want to talk about the potential maybe of expanding Walden's influence on a global scale uh, one of the examples we're going to be using today is uh, China, but it could be any of the countries. We could be talking about Russia or Australia or New Zealand. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that we just understand where they're coming from and why they are different. Okay, next slide. And so what we are going to be addressing is the who. Now, it's not just the who for the students, but it's also who is us as instructors. Who are we talking about? And and where are our students coming from? We, we want to talk about the, the, just the general who, what, why, where, when, and how. I think it's really important as we go global in, in our classrooms. We want to talk about when we want to implement these, uh, this global expansion and, and why we want to increase the global expansion. Is it is it solely because we want more students or more money, or is it because we want to enrich the process of education and, and in the environment? And finally, we want to talk about how do we implement this program. Let me give one example before we go to the next slide. I was talking to uh, Dr. Soon from Xi'an University of Science and Technology in China. And Dr. Soon has you know, it's interesting, he, he went out and purchased a university. I don't know how much those things cost, 200 million, 300 million, but he just bought a university of 15,000 students in Xi'an. And, and we were talking, I was teaching classes for him, and he told me, I can supply you 200 students every year or every semester into your courses. And, and I got to thinking, I thought, you know, this would be a mistake. Now, if we wanted to try out a cohort of 25 students, that might work out really well for us. But if we just start out with 200, we might make some errors and then we'd lose all of our future students. So we want to address the how do we start this process. Next slide, please. Right now, we do have in our classroom students from everywhere. You know, inevitably, we are going to enlarge that and include more places than we even do now. One of the reasons in my on-campus courses, I have students from Korea and from Brazil and from Africa and from China, and they just add a valuable asset in the classroom because they just have different experiences that, that we can share in, within the classroom. Exactly the same thing will happen in online classroom. 
and so we just need to understand the cultural diversity and see how we can make our classrooms better. Next slide, please. This slide, on, on this presentation, we won't be, because of copyright issues, we won't be uh, implementing these, but I, I would like you to write down this YouTube, or you can go to YouTube and search and say, Sudan, Sudanese, S-U-D-A-N-E-S-E, -E, cultural experience. It's a really interesting video of seven or eight students coming over from to the United States from Sudan. And as they come over, it's a whole different experience for them. See, there's two factors at play here with the, the cultural uh, situation with their students. First, they need to understand the cultural environment of American universities. They're very different from many of the universities they are used to going to. In the lecture style, in the assignments, everything is different to them. And the second one is the cultural environment of, well, right now, cultural environment of Americans. We are just different. When students come over from a foreign country, they're immersed into two different cultures at the same time, the academic culture and also the uh, environment or the social culture. And if we can get them breaking into one at a time, it just makes it easy. That's why Walden is so valuable for this, for the students who eventually maybe want to come and get advanced degrees from a university here in the United States or even take many courses from Walden and then maybe they'd want to transfer out. But, but whether they complete their full degree from Walden or complete part of it, this is a very crucial step for them. In this video with the, the students from Sudan, they just experience things that we're familiar with and we would not know that they wouldn't understand. For example, in Sudan, they do everything in groups and they walk around in groups. They go into stores in groups. They do everything in groups. In America, our culture is pretty much individualism. And so when the Sudan students would go into a store, maybe eight or 10 of them all in a group, it would make the store owners very nervous with so many people coming in as a group. Or they would, uh, anyway, there's just many things that it was hard for them to understand where we are coming from. Well, in the online classroom, we can, we can harvest those that diversity in that just makes the classroom really rich. So if you go on at some later time, just look up in YouTube, just Sudanese uh, student uh, cultural environment or something like that. And, and I th think you'll like it. It's about uh, five or six minutes long. Next slide. Originally, uh, Dr. Zing Chao from Wuhan, China was presenting with me in, in Tampa, Florida, and we presented this presentation from a Chinese point of view and also from an American point of view. Dr. Chao has taught in America for a semester and she teaches in the universities in China, and so she, it was a good mix between understanding both of them. But specifically for part of this presentation, then we're going to talk about why the Chinese students are different and how they are different. Okay, next slide. Uh, I, well, then Brian, I'll talk about this in a minute. Okay, generally, you say, what is our impression of Chinese or Asian students? And you see on the picture with the V for victory sign, this is very, very typical of Chinese students when they take pictures. It's just, 
they're different and we want to understand why they're different. Okay, let's go on to the next slide because I'd like to address what makes the Chinese students the way they are. This would be a kindergarten and uh, they start going to kindergarten at three years old. Generally, as you know, probably that Chinese parents have the one child policy in China. Recently, they can have two children if they both come from a one child parent. But because of that, most of the parents in China are working and so they send their kids to school, to the state sported school at three years old. And this, these pictures are typical of the, the kindergarten in China. Okay, next slide. A typical schedule for three to six year olds is they get up at 7.30 and then uh, their parents walk them to school and they have breakfast in the school. Generally it'll be a rice, uh, a, a rice breakfast or something like that matter. And then at nine o'clock they have their first class and then they have gymnastics and then they have their second class till noon. And you can see the cute little pictures of them having uh, exercises. Okay, next slide. Then at noon they they have lunch, and then they all take a nap from uh, for an hour and ten minutes. And here's some pictures of them both eating their lunch together, and it's pretty much state supported. And then they all settle down for their naps every day. Okay, next slide. Then they have their third class and their fourth class and half an hour before they get out, they have snacks and then they go outside and they wait for their parents. Interesting in, thing in China, the parents are all sitting outside the school, just dozens of them waiting to pick up their children after school. So what do they learn in kindergarten? These are three to six year olds, much earlier than our kindergarten. Next slide. They go over uh, art and math and it's amazing the, the five year olds are doing math that our fourth graders are doing in America. In, in, by the time they're four years old, they're doing addition and subtraction. And much of this is just simple, like up to 20 or something and then they have PE. Now when they're five and six, they also do mathematics and they do the Chinese pronunciation and spelling. Both, if you look at the upper right hand corner has the pigeon, I mean the pinion pronunciation of things and we also down below has the, the characters for Chinese and they learn both of these, both the pinyin and also the Chinese characters. They learn reading, they do English also with the 26 letter alphabets and then they have art and gaming. And these are five and six year olds, they're already learning a second language. Okay, next slide. So cost wise, the public kindergarten is free. If they want to go to a private kindergarten, which has smaller classrooms, because generally the public ones are 40 to 50 students in a classroom and the private ones would be about 25. It costs, these are in American dollars, US dollars, so it'd be a thousand to two thousand dollars a year. And if they go on a bilingual kindergarten where they speak to them only in English in the Chinese uh, environment that it can be five to eight thousand dollars a year. In addition to that, they can have after school, they can have art classes or music classes and they do, they can have ping pong classes or English classes and the prices are listed right here. Okay, next slide. Now in elementary school, it's very similar to the ones in the United States. They go from six years old till they're 12 years old. You can see this is a very typical classroom right here. Um, so we have five, 10, 15, about uh, 35, 40 students. 
and they're very well behaved. Of course, it's just kind of ingrained into them, and so they don't uh, cause problems at all. On the left-hand side is a typical layout of a school. They have a play area in the in the middle, in a courtyard, and then they have many, many classrooms. They're going to have 40 or 50 classrooms in these buildings on, on the left. Next slide. In elementary school, the it's similar to kindergarten. They've got their first and second classes, and then they always have, uh, these are eye exercises they do. And for what reason, I'm not sure, but they all do eye exercises for 15 minutes every day. Then they have another two classes. So they have four classes before noon. They have the flag raising ceremony every single morning. And if you look behind the flag, it just shows all of these different classrooms. We see four floors there, and there are just dozens of classrooms. And, and this is the very typical down on the bottom right hand corner of a flag ceremony and uh, for the Chinese flag. Next slide. Then they have noon and they have a nap in elementary school, just like they did in, pre in, in kindergarten. They have three more classes in the afternoon. So they have a total of seven classes. Then in the evening, they are not finished. Uh, Generally, what they have is either one or two classes in the evening, and they, and they generally get home about between eight and nine o'clock in the, in the evening, and then they go to sleep about 10 o'clock. Uh, the curriculum for elementary school, they do, they study math and Chinese and art, BE, all the basic stuff that we uh, learn over here, but then in grade two, they add English to that. And, and they add in grade three, they have English three times a week. And in uh, grade four to six, they have English three and four times a week. Chinese is three hours a day. And the cost, again, is free if it's public. Most of the parents, they want their kids to be successful and so they give them extra classes and this will make sense in just a little bit because we talk about how competitive it is in china but they can have extra music classes or art classes or math classes or, or chinese and these will go till eight or nine o'clock in the, every evening okay next slide middle school these, this is similar to our middle school. It's from 12 to 15 years old. They, they uh, go to school at eight. They, they have flag raising ceremony only on Mondays. And then they have four classes in the morning. Then they have their eye exercises and gymnastics. And uh, next slide. Then they also have their quiet time, their lunch and their nap, and they, and they generally just sleep at their desk. Then they have another four classes in the afternoon. They go till 5.30, starting at 8 o'clock in the morning. In the United States, we generally go this till about uh, 3.30, maybe 4, starting at 8.30. So they just have more classes there. In the evening, they're not finished yet. From 5.30 to 6.30, they eat, and then they have evening classes until 8 o'clock at night, generally going to bed about 11. Their classes are Monday through Friday, and then they, they meet uh, Saturday morning until noon. Next slide. The curriculum for the middle school is similar to elementary. They've got the Chinese classes, the English classes, the math classes, they're very proficient with speaking English. And then the hard sciences, the physics and the chemistry and geography and PE, and then they can have other classes with uh, political science and morality and art. And the morality, that's an interesting thing for China, as we know, they, uh, let me just pause here for a minute. We know that they, uh, let me see how I word this. They, they borrow a lot. They don't consider it 
consider it theft. I asked my, I was teaching an ethics class over there and I said, how many of you have Microsoft Office on your computer? Every single hand went up. And then I said, how many paid for Microsoft? And they said, huh? Oh no, we don't pay, it's free, it's on the internet. And, and see, they don't feel like this is wrong to take it. The government's always supplied them everything they needed, and so they just uh, get that. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Again, it's free for the public schools, and then you can see the different additional courses they can take in the evenings and on Saturday and Saturday afternoon. They can, they, ping pong is, is really big in China, and basketball is is big, and then they take the, the English classes because they need to pass the, the TOEFL exams for English exams to get into the higher universities. And of course, they they want the hard sciences as well. Okay, next slide. At the end of middle school, I take a final examination. And of all the people that take about 50% of them uh, can go into high school. Depending on the scores they take, about 10% of those get to be in the better high schools. And uh, the 10% the of the 50%, I mean 10% of the total and about 40% go into the common high schools, which is not as easy to get into the tier one universities when they finish. Then there's about 30% go into the skills training and some go into international schools, some study abroad, 10% fail. But this is just kind of a slide of where they come from. Out of the tier one high schools, of course the chances of getting into a tier one university is much stronger than just with the common high schools. Let's leave it on this slide just for one minute. Uh, when we talk about competition, competition in China is extremely, extremely difficult, uh, competitive. They, uh, for example, Dr. Chow, who was putting on this presentation with me, wanted to go to Wuhan University to get her doctorate. Wuhan is the number three university in China. It's like uh, the Harvard of China or something like that. Well, they gave an examination to 100,000 students that wanted to get into the university. Out of the 100,000, 10,000 passed the exam, 90,000 failed the exam. From the, from the 10,000 that passed, they narrowed it down to 1,000 through looking at resumes and interviews and papers and those kind of things. And then out of the 100,000, they chose nine individuals that could get into Wuhan University in the doctoral program. Three in economics, three in, I don't know what the two other areas were, but anyway, so out of 100,000, they only accepted three to get into the doctoral program at Wuhan. It's just, uh, competition that is, is fierce, we, we just don't even understand that or can relate to it in the United States. Okay, next slide. And, and so high school is very serious. They, uh, um, here's just a typical thing, they're, how, where they're studying, they, they don't date in high school, they don't even date in the university because it's so, uh, they're so involved with school and everything that they don't have time to really do social stuff. But but these two pictures are very good examples in high school. Go back to go forward one. Okay, go into high school on the next slide. They they start at 7:30, and every Monday they have the flag ceremony, and then they have four classes, and they also have their I exercises and their lunch and their nap. Then they have four more classes till 5.30. They eat supper and then they have classes till 9.30 at night. So they start at 7.30 in the morning and they go till 9.30 at night. That's Monday through Friday and then Saturday morning. And generally the 
high school students get to go to sleep about 11.30 to 1 o'clock in the morning, and then they have to get up at 6 o'clock the next morning. In high school, the reason we're talking about this is just to let us know, kind of understand where they're coming from a little bit. They do social science courses, the history and the politics and the geography, and they also do the science science classes like physics and chemistry and biology. They finish all the courses in the first two years and then the third year is all a review year, getting ready for final examinations. They have examinations generally on the first week of June. They last a whole week. Okay, next slide. Here's, here's an example of these are parents waiting outside for their for their kids to take the examinations. The examinations last all day long on three or four days. They'll go for seven, five or six hours of testing. And then they go out to see their parents waiting just outside the gate. And then they come back the next day and go through the examinations all over again. Okay, next slide. In the final examination, 30% of those go to a university. And then you can see that only 1% of all the Chinese get a PhD. Maybe that's similar to what it is in the United States. For the universities, pretty much those are paid for by the family. And if they go to international school, they're definitely paid for by the family. And study abroad, of course, they're paid for by the family. Of the final exam, 10% fail, and they just kind of drop out, or they will go to a technical institution or skills training institution later. But we're looking at 4.3 billion people in the world. To, to give an idea of how this, uh, oh, let's go to the next slide, because I think I've got some, okay. Yeah, let's talk about this, then I'll go on. So let's look at this same picture. How do we look at uh, Chinese students? Well, they all have a high English score. They're, score. they're bilingual. They're, they're very serious. They're, it's a very narrow life width. They, they, don't, uh, they don't date. It, it's just they're constantly involved in school all the way through. And they're very self-disciplined and they're hardworking. And the reason they are is because they have to be or they can't make it. For example, if... Uh, if the students want an internship, there may be 200 booths of people who are offering internships and there'll be 6,000 students vying for those internships. It, it's just, uh, it's amazing. Okay, next slide. So let's look at uh, China as a university country because it's, it's important that Walden be able to see the opportunity to, to branch out into China. Wuhan, one of their smaller cities, Wuhan is 13 million people, Shanghai is 26 million, Beijing is 22, Xi'an is about 20 million. But anyway, Wuhan, for example, has 100 universities in one city. Now, I live in the state of Utah. We have eight universities in our whole state. Wuhan has 100 in the one city, and these universities have between eight and uh, 25,000 students. If you go to Guangzhou, for example, they have one university complex, they have 10 universities, all in a big, in the same area, and they have 20,000 students apiece. In one area, we're looking at 200,000 university students just in a, in a, just a small little area. And uh, one of the things that Walden, I think, can do is branch out into these different areas. Like we could go into Xi'an, we could go into Xi'an University of Science and Technology or the International University or Xi'an University. Anyway, any of these 80 universities that Xi'an has, but we need to cherry pick to say, where are we going? You just can't say, oh, here we are, we're Walden, anybody could come. Same thing with Beijing or Shanghai. We need to pinpoint very narrowly because the Chinese are all about uh, 
relationships and trust. And we just can't throw our shingle out and say, okay, everybody join. They want to know who we are. So how do we implement and where? Well, we need to pick out what universities in Wuhan do we want to have uh, a relationship with? Do we go to Hubei Normal un University? Do we go to Wuhan University? Do we go to Wuchang University? Do we go to Wuhan Science and Technology University? There, there's hundreds of universities and we need to have a, a close relationship one with one university or two or three, but we can't just say, okay, everybody come to us. See, right now we're different in the United States. How do we implement? The best way to implement is for them to know us and us to know them, which means somebody from Walden has to go over and build a relationship with the administrators, the president of the university, like Dr. Soon in Xi'an University, or Dr. Leo, or any of these different administrators until they trust us. And then they say, yes, please bring Walden students here. We'd, we'd love to join your online university. The next one is why. Why would we want to do this? Well, there's several reasons, and one of them, of course, an initial one is that it's, it's much more money. We have millions and millions of students that can join into our university and our coffers. And the other reason why is because we want to have diversity so that we can strengthen Walden as, as for ourselves and for others, and it just makes classrooms stronger and and uh, a better adaptation. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Oh, uh, okay, we, we've kind of addressed the, the why. We need to know, we need to go in there for the right reasons. And money is not the right reason. Money is, uh, it, it, it's there, that's true, but the main reason we go is not for money. If we do, we'll fail. And we need to address how do we get there? How do we get into Wuchang University as opposed to Wuhan University as opposed to Hubei Normal as opposed to Wuhan Continental University? How do we know, how do we get the relationship going? Because once we do, then we can see much success come out of China. Now, this was just an example from China, but any of the, any of the institutions anywhere in the world, whether it be Hamilton or Christchurch, New Zealand, or uh, Brisbane, Australia, we can expand anywhere with Walden. We have that opportunity and the internet, we can, wherever they have Wi-Fi, we can get our uh, program in, but we need to know how are we going to do this and we need to do it correctly because if we don't, then we'll just uh, mess up. Anyway, I'm sorry that Dr. Chow is, is not here uh, sharing with you. Actually, I will be, I'm going over to China in four days, and so I will be seeing her and teaching at her university, who by normal university, uh, this next week. But she would make this much more exciting than I did just because she's just lovable. And uh, if you have any questions at all, I have my email address down there, brill.anderson at mail.waldenu.edu. Now, the reason I have this is the best way for us to understand culture is to go there. The best way for us to understand New Zealanders is to be there and, and, and gather their culture before we try to uh, going there the best way we can go to China is to be there. And so for that reason, just for anybody that wants in for more information, I take a group to New Zealand every year and we go to Hobbiton, the Lord of the Rings movie set and Glowworm Caves and Pakarirua, the Maori village and, and lots of stuff because if we understand the culture, then we can work with them. And that's every December because it's summertime down there in May. I take 
in, in June, I mean, I take groups to China every year and we go on the Great Wall, Tiananmen Square, Forbidden City, Terracotta Warriors, because the best way we can work with people in our classrooms or as a university is to know them. And so we just learn their culture, open our eyes, and it just works out really well. And I appreciate Lita moderating this. And uh, Lita, I'll just turn it over to you if you have more comments feel free to put them in right now. Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Anderson. Once again, it was a pleasure to to uh, listen to your offering today. I had the pleasure of uh, moderating it in Tampa, Florida this past January at the 2019 National Faculty Meeting. So it's been a pleasure and thank you so much for your dedication to this topic. And we thank all of the viewers for taking time out of your day to view this fabulous offering. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you for showing up.